Hello, everyone. My name is Greg Bowman. I'm the Dean at Roger Williams University School of Law, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Integrating Doctrine and Diversity Speaker Series event. We're so pleased today to have uh, Attorney Anu Gupta with us to talk about breaking bias. This is the fourth year of this event, and um, it's become a signature event that we and our other co-sponsors are so proud and pleased to offer. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Nicole Jasleski, a professor of law and assistant dean for academic innovation at Roger Williams University School of Law. But first, I would like to read our law school's land and labor acknowledgement. So as we, we begin our program today, I want to take this moment to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming here today from many places and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located in Bristol, Rhode Island. And so we acknowledge and we honor the Narragansett and Poconocet people, as well as Soames, the original name of the land on which our campus resides. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if not for the free enslaved labor of black people. And we recognize that the town of Bristol and the very land on which our campus resides have benefited significantly from the trade of enslaved people from Africa. The economy of wealth generated to the human lives. During this time of ongoing national reckoning with our history and the treatment of legacy of the African diaspora and the black lives, knowledge and skills stolen due to white supremacy and violence. As we gather here today, the movement for justice and liberation is building in our country. Yet many are still being met with violence and even being killed while other people in our country actively work to stand in the way of progress. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege. And as upholders of justice, we believe that our students, who soon will be practitioners of law, can be and already are agents of change as well. Thank you again again for being at this program today, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Nicole. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, it is absolutely unbelievable, but we have now been doing this for four years. Um, I want to start by expressing gratitude to those of you who are attending today, um, and those of you who are watching this later on YouTube, welcome. I want to thank our continuing sponsors, CUNY Law, Jurist, Berkeley Law, and GW Law. And I also want to take a moment to thank and announce our newest sponsor this year, the Anti-Racist Development Institute. I am such a fan of the work they're doing and who they are as human beings, and I'm so happy to have them as our newest co-sponsor. And that is a perfect segue to today's conversation with Anu, because I met him at an Anti-Racist Development Institute event. Anu Gupta is the author of the forthcoming book, Breaking Bias, Where Stereotypes and Prejudices Come From, and the Science-Backed Method to Unravel Them. Um, we will share the links, as we would in a proper book talk, we will share the links in the chat um, to purchase the book, which is coming out next week. Um, I would now usually announce a guest. I would tell you a little bit about Anu, tell you about Anu's degrees and scholarship, but instead I feel like uh, having read everything Anu has written, uh, there is nothing that I can say in a few sentences that will really do him justice. So instead I will say this, Anu Gupta knows Oprah and he knows the Dalai Lama. And that is the coolest thing I could probably say about anybody. Um, but seriously, Anu, uh, as serious as I get, can you talk a little bit about your identity, your professional path, and how you came to write this amazing book, Breaking Bias? Because 
having read everything, your life and your professional journey defy like a, a simple pithy, a new Gupta went to school here and then did this. Uh, can you share a little bit about how, how we got here today? Thank you so much, Nicole, first of all, for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. And I want to welcome everyone who's listening and who's here, as well as those watching later. Um, wow, like that was um, a really interesting introduction. I wasn't expecting that because I do just love people reading my bio, but I do think it's really important to share a little bit about how I got to this book, Breaking Bias. So there's two aspects of it. First, of course, is quite personal. So who I am, you know, I'm a brown skinned, you know, queer man who immigrated to the U.S. when I was 10 years old um, in the mid 90s, you know, and very quickly became another, you know, so I experienced a lot of otherness because the way I looked, my accent, the way I walked, you know, just hiding a lot of those parts of me and things got a little bit, you know, more difficult after 9-11, where I was assumed to be Muslim and of Arab descent and thereby kind of the target of a lot of bigotry Islamophobia, queerphobia, and others. But as like a young immigrant, you know, who was kind of an introvert and kind of brainy and nerdy, I just kind of suppressed a lot of those emotions all my life and instead kind of channeled it toward education. Um, so in college, I was pre-med, but then I dropped that to become an Islamic studies major, international relations major, because I wanted to understand why are people so cruel? What's the cause of injustice? Um, and that took me further to my graduate work I'm at Cambridge, where I studied and trained in systems design thinking to identify the root causes of social and economic challenges globally, such as poverty, inequality, and injustice. And that really led me to law school, wanting to practice human rights law, anti-discrimination law. But throughout that like professional academic journey, I was also still struggling with what had happened to me, you know, how I'd gone into the closet, because I, I knew that the world I lived in wasn't safe for people like me. And I also had believed a lot of the lies that were shared about people of my background. I went by the name Andy for a very long time, for example, um, in order to fit in, in order to assimilate. But things got really difficult in law school um, because of this idea that we couldn't talk about bias openly, racism, sexism, homophobia, and all the isms and phobias. And as someone who was deeply impacted by that, I found myself on the ledge of my 18th floor window about to jump off. This was right before the beginning of my second year of law school. Thankfully, instead of falling forward, I fell backward into my apartment. And that moment really began my own breaking bias journey to really you know, bear witness to and understand the stories I, I learned about myself and how those stories really limited my own potential. With that said, I continue to pursue, like, you know, on the one hand, my healing journey around breaking bias, but a career in human rights and anti-discrimination law. And I started to notice that we have all these beautiful policies in the books with respect to anti-discrimination, but the patterns of inequality and injustice based on race, gender, sexuality, class, you name it, and other human identities across life outcomes have not changed, despite, you know, you know, the truth of civil rights era and ever since. And for me, that's what really got to me. And, you know, it really came to a head in law school once again, when I was in a sentencing court hearing and I was working with the folks in the courts, the judges, the prosecutors on the court side and witnessed a judge giving sentence to a defendant box full of black boys and men, I would say ages 15 to 40 max, um, for petty, petty, petty offenses, trespass to property, breaking cell phones, low level possession of marijuana for two, three, four years at a time. And I just couldn't imagine the cruelty that was happening and how these lives were just disposable. And the injustice I felt within my body at that moment is really like, well, this is more than just changing policy. There are certain perceptions, you know, that everyone in the courtroom is holding that makes this completely normal. And the fact that we're not talking about these very grave injustices, at least at my law school. And I went to an elite law school. I went to NYU Law. Um, so it may be that. So that's kind of where I discovered the science of implicit bias and learned that unless we support people that make up legal institutions, 
um, and other institutions break bias, conscious and unconscious biases, we will not be able to ensure equity and justice in our systems. Um, and, you know, for me, one of my guiding stars has been Dr. King's quote, our goal is to build a beloved community. This requires qualitative shifts in our hearts and quantitative shift in our shifts in our lives. For me, breaking bias is that, you know, we've changed the policies somewhat, you know, we're going back now. And a lot of that going back is because we have yet to shift hearts and minds. It's so that simultaneous work of understanding our common humanity is what brought me to it, you know, more personally. To, and I feel like I was chosen for this work. <laughs> I also was very struck through by reading about you, how you have a natural sense of curiosity and you embrace it and you just keep going. You're yeah. not, uh, okay, I figured it out. You're, uh, okay, I figured this out. Now I have to figure that out. The the yes end. Okay, great. Yeah. And then more. And I, I love that. It 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 makes it so easy to, to root you on, but it also <laughs> makes you so relatable because I, I feel like, I mean, my background is as a librarian. That's the type of people we are. And yeah. so it's this, this, like natural curiosity that comes out in your work that I just, I, I loved. I felt like it, not only was talking about the things that are most important to me, but it also was backing it up with stories about your travel, perspectives from other people, data, science. And to me, that that was what made this so exciting. Um, most of the audience today, like, like we were talking about, are legal professionals. With this very cleverly named series, we talk about how to integrate doctrine and diversity, or in other words, consider ways in which we can talk about social justice and DEIB skills within and throughout the law school curriculum. As you mentioned in your book and your opening story, you went to law school and really struggled. Um, can you share a bit about your experiences and why openly discussing and teaching about bias in law school spaces is not only doable, but critical to moving forward? Yeah, thank you. And it's actually absolutely essential. And part of, you know, my story is that when I, you know, my first two years, you know, first year of law school in particular, when I went through the doctrinal classes, whether it was contracts or con law or criminal law, a lot of the things we were dealing with and reading about had to do with human identities, about the race, you know, the racial categorization of our humanity, about our gender, our sex. And yet we weren't talking about where these things come from, how these things develop, and the emotional impact of that trauma, particularly for folks that are, you know, survivor of survivors of sexual abuse, of rape. And for me, that was really interesting, right? Because and things have changed slightly since I went to law school. And I think for me, one of the biggest challenges that needs to shift in the teaching of the law in the legal classroom is that we still operating within our legal system and legal classrooms um, in this puritanical shame-driven paradigm of good and bad, right and wrong, right? And I think part of the fear is that, oh my God, if we touch and talk about bias, I don't know how to handle it. It's going to be super explosive. It's going to be a minefield. And, you know, I just won't be able to control, so better not look at it. Even though all the students and the professors, some professors, I'm sure, for sure, who want to talk about these issues. So I think that fear of shame is one of the challenges. And, you know, this kind of shows up as this paradigm of like being the good guy or the bad guy, the good white people or the bad white people, right? And we basically kick each other out of our hearts. And we don't see the fullness of our humanity. And I feel like life is more complicated. And Here's why, you know, I think for me, breaking bias was so important as work, because I've been working on this as well. Like I started my organization 10 years ago to train people in breaking bias. And for me, the challenges around DEIB is that oftentimes it becomes psychologically unsafe. And there's a lot of shame, blame, guilt in the conversation. And these afflictive emotions actually prevent people from learning and changing behavior, shifting mindsets. So I think for me, that's where the science of adult learning was really helpful, which I have incorporated is that, oh, we need to make this conversation depersonalize it because this stuff happened, you know, injustice, inequity, enslavement, genocide, 
you know, exclusion of women and queer people. It happened. It shouldn't have, but it did. So like getting folks to accept that and that requires a training environment that's really shame-free and safe. And I think once we do that, we can really get to bias head on because at least in our country, I mean, around the world, the legal structures that we have was founded upon, you know, white supremacy around patriarchy, misogyny, you know, queer phobia, ableism, you name it, right? It was created to um, really have a certain segment of our population really run the country, but not from like an affect of like, oh my God, like people that belong to a certain privileged group of people are bad. It's like, no, this is faulty by design, right? So this is what we, we as lawyers, legal practitioners, as law professors, as well as future lawyers need to fix, to really live up to the aspiration of our country and of um, our international norms, that every human being has dignity, inherent dignity, and can and should have access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness through basic social, political, cultural, and political rights. Um, so that's where I would say, you know, how we can really make our legal classrooms more inclusive around this. One last thing I'll say is that it's also important to define bias. I think often there's a misperception that bias is inherent, you know, um, but actually bias is not, you know, and this is where the neuroscience is so helpful. And when I discovered this and I'm kind of a living, breathing example of breaking bias, um, if bias is a learned habit, you know, it's a learned habit. It shows up in two ways. It's conscious biases that are false beliefs, learned false beliefs, and unconscious biases that are learned habits of thoughts. These are associations. And both of these forms of biases actually distort how we perceive, reason, remember, and make decisions. And as attorneys and law professors, we're really familiar with this, right? The research on implicit bias, how it shows up in the courtroom and jury decisions and prosecutorial decisions, you name it, judge decisions. And this is what the neuroscience has shown we can actually train professionals in unlearning. And for me, that's what's really exciting. It's the opportunity to actually imagine and then realize a country and a world where people can just be who they are. Like I can just be my queer brown immigrant self without having to like constantly justify my existence, you know, and so can everyone else. I, I thought there were two things in there that I really wanted to highlight. One is that it's not uh, it, 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 bias or discrimination or these policies is not something that happened over there. It also happened here in our legal community. And so yeah. to me, that's even more reason um, and then I think y you're talking about how it's not so simple and we need to bring our whole selves. I guess I hear from professors sometimes, well, the doctrine is so complicated. Uh, how can I bring even more into the classroom? And I think mm -hmm. the answer to that is you're bringing all that into the classroom, whether you're intending to or not, because yeah. it is dangerous for us to not be able to bring our whole selves in. Um, yeah. But I, I like that you're, focus is not on what we're not doing, but your focus is on the possibility of what we can be doing. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about which you, the story you told in the book about your working as an intern in 2010 in New Orleans, sitting in on sentencing hearings. Um, and you talk about being devastated with grief um, and that this feeling of grief and being just devastated with it. And you shared the feelings with your colleagues and their uh, response was to accuse you of being emotional and irrational. Um, and you say in the book, you, quote, receive lots of heady language to explain away, ignore, and repress the pain my colleagues likely felt in their bodies, hearts, and minds, end quote. We're many years later, but I'm not sure how much in law has changed. Um, last fall semester, I had a professor tell me about the reactions of his students in my race class that this is the law, there is no room for emotions in the law while we're talking about a class where we on purpose talk about race. Um, what, in your approximation, what room is there for feelings and emotions in legal classrooms and, and legal settings? I think it's absolutely necessary. And I think sadly what 
your colleagues or one of the professors shared with you is a false story that we really deluded ourselves with um, because the law is all about emotions and feeling. You know, Justice Blackman, you know, 20th century Supreme Court justice said at the constitutional level where we work, 90% of any decision is emotional. The rational part of us supplies the reasons for our preferences. So the vast majority in the science shows is the vast majority of our daily decisions are rooted in emotions, what's known as affect. And I talk about this in the book and, you know, basically, and that is who we are as human beings. You know, we like to believe this Cartesian lie that I think, therefore I am, but actually we're a lot more than just thinking beings. It's a part of who we are. And, you know, one thing I like to remind folks is that, you know, thinking and logic is so important, but it serves, it makes a good servant not a good master. And when it becomes a master, it gets us into really messy situations, you know, that are very ethically ambiguous. And for me, that is why kind of beginning to really train law professors and anyone who's in the legal classroom to invite emotions. And all we have to do is be mindful of it, right? This is why one of the tools that breaks bias, the, the five tools, first tool is really mindfulness. It's like, oh, Yes, there's discomfort here. Yes, there may be trauma here. Yes, and we don't have to do anything about it. We don't have to fix anyone. If people, like if I as a student, I'm going through discomfort, it's just like, oh, I see you, I hear you, right? It's painful. These are some resources. And I think that's really important because it then helps us become better advocates. Because what we've done biologically, physiologically is metabolize those emotions. What I hadn't done for a very long time is I didn't metabolize those emotions. I was denying them and suppressing them. And that manifested, you know, in a whole host of mental health challenges that I had to then face with mindfulness and other tools to then begin to transform. And this is one of the reasons why I feel, you know, that there is a, there's an epidemic of mental health challenges in our profession right, addictions and various coping mechanisms because we witness so much harm on a day-to-day -day basis and we feel so helpless because regardless of where we are, <clears throat> regardless of where we are on the political spectrum, we are human beings, we're conscious beings, right? When we witness such pain, you know, it affects us. And if we don't acknowledge it, that, so these are the types of skills I feel like it's so important uh, for us to have ourselves, but also to provide um, our future lawyers to really, again, build a nation where we all belong in the fullness of our diversity. Uh, I often talk uh, on here and, and in real life um, how I think that vulnerability should be one of the core values in legal education and, and the practice of law. Um, I think that there's this feeling that we are the all-powerful, all-knowing sage on the stage and that we're not a human being. And I know yeah. that sort of our, our vulnerability is tied up in privilege. And so I want to acknowledge that. But um, I really think that there needs to be some recognition of my humanity as a teacher. And like, it, it, and I know a lot of people disagree with this, but I have my students call me Nicole. And I say the reason is, well, the reason is because I can't pronounce my last name. <laughs> but an additional reason is because I am a human before I am a law professor. Amen. I, I want you to realize that I'm standing up here having a conversation with you as a human being. Yeah. Um, I don't know that that's, I don't know that that always sort of works in my favor. I think some students want a sage on the stage. They want an all knowing person they can look up to. They want a right and a wrong. I just think that, that that's not realistic, at least for me. Um, and so uh, you started talking about this um, but I I'd love to hear more about it, uh, the process of breaking biases and what you call the PRISM toolkit. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think part of the challenge is that, you know, we train our students and young people in our society to think that there's a right or a wrong and not be in the gray when life is so gray. It's all gray, right? Um, but I think for us to really... The exciting opportunity for me is that just as biases are learned, they can be unlearned. And this is the magic of neuroplasticity. You know, our ability in our nervous systems, in our brains to actually rewire itself, which requires practice. You know, all of us, you know, 
we didn't kind of we weren't born brushing our teeth you know once we had teeth we had to actually practice on a daily basis and we built that habit um and it's some for most of us it's like a no brainer now um so very similarly it's really about acknowledging bias noticing it and the five tools that really help that have been shown to be efficacious um through a lot of social and neurosciences prism and it starts with m and goes up to p and it really starts with mindfulness which is basically the awareness noticing when stereotypes arise in our mind when certain stories arise in our mind we notice them become aware of them and that creates a space because then we're not you know perceiving remembering and making decisions based on those stereotypes so it helps us kind of really move to a different way of thinking the second tool is really stereotype replacement which is a mindfulness practice which is once we recognize stereotypes we notice and acknowledge them as stereotypes but then replace them with positive counter examples so in the lab it was you know when we see a black person or a black man in particular um think of dr king but it doesn't have to be dr king it could be literally our students our our friends our family members our you know business partners anyone right who doesn't stand up to that stereotype so what it's doing is it's weakening you know neurons that fire together wire together it's weakening that firing of that association and that's the daily practice right that that's a moment to moment practice then we move to individuation which is basically a skill around curiosity when i'm with nicole i'm with nicole versus my ideas of who nicole is that's really important right this is cultivating interest um and beginning to individuate and then we move to hard practices of pro social behaviors and perspective taking which are really active cultivation of positive mental and emotional states like compassion joy altruism equanimity and you know for a lot of lawyers including myself um when i first learned about these tools i was like oh my god is this too woo woo except the neuroscience around this is so clear you know there's one practice that i had done personally it's called a loving kindness practice where we basically share positive affirmations toward ourselves and toward others for like 5 to 10 minutes at a time or longer may i be happy may i be healthy may i be safe may i live with ease and we can also do that for stereotyped groups you know people we actually particularly people that we don't know we may not have in our lives and what it does it it's actually what it does it shifts that emotional affect associated with various you know stereotyped identities so it's reducing that fear within our nervous systems and building intimacy across difference and that's what the opportunity is for us to really kind of retrain our minds and retrain our nervous systems and i think it's really important for legal practitioners to of course do that for themselves because they're facing so much on a daily basis particularly if they're going in the courtroom or the classroom but also to teach our students and you know it takes anywhere from 3 to 8 weeks to build a new habit so of course this is a lifelong practice but to build this practice isn't like a tall order right um and that's why and they're absolutely free these tools so we don't have to go through some like really intense anti racism or dei training those are good too but this is really about now digesting and metabolizing who we want to be and i'll share a personal anecdote that i did that practice i shared loving kindness practice for myself um 20 minutes a day you know once or twice a day for 2 years and the effect of that was just transformative in terms of beginning to distance myself from the stereotypes i consciously unconsciously believed about myself so i mean and this is all demonstrated you know stanford medical school has a whole center dedicated to studying um you know the r and p of prism so yeah um thanks i'm going to interject an audience question cuz i think it's a good time for it Great. i think um you you described it as a little woo woo which is literally exactly how i describe it um but it, the the question is there are adopters and there are resistors um it, there are people who think well this is too woo woo for me and there are people who this is exactly what they need to hear how do you address the movable middle 
Um, do, do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, I do. I'm going to ask everyone to practice with me, actually. So I'm not going to talk. I'm going to have everyone experience one of these tools, if that's okay. Um, we're going to do it for one minute, so it's not very long. So I'm just going to ask you to come to a comfortable seated or standing position wherever you are. Close your eyes if that's comfortable to you, or place your gaze at a stationary point in front of you. And just for a moment, begin to go within and notice your breath. This breath entering your body, this breath leaving your body. And feeling a sense of gratitude for this body, this body that's your ultimate home. It allows you to see, be, experience life. And see if you can share with this body a few well wishes. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I live with ease. If there's resistance, that's okay. Notice the resistance. And then bring yourself back to just repeating these phrases from a place of sincerity and genuine care for this being that's right here. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I live with ease. Now see if you can extend these same well wishes to one person or one living being that you love, that you really care about, perhaps a spouse or a child or a pet. Notice this being in the window of your mind and sharing these well wishes with them. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be safe. May you live with ease. And notice this being really received these well wishes from you. And thank you for holding them in such high regard. Just take a moment to notice anything else that happens in the body. Perhaps a sense of spaciousness. Relaxation. And then after your next exhale, you can bring your chin to your chest, stretching the back of your neck. And then if your eyes were closed, you can open them and return to our space together. So that was a short, a very short, you know, pro-social behavior exercise mixed with mindfulness. But imagine doing that for 20 minutes. Right? Because we're inundated with so much negativity, particularly by the media on a daily basis, what this does is actually moves against the stream. And I think for me, the, first of all, I'm not attached to moving anybody because the transformation for me is really starts from within. Like really change. If we can change ourselves, I'm like, oh my God, life well lived, right? As I think Plato or Socrates said or someone else said. But with that said, I think there are people that are really wanting this, but some whatever language I'm using or we're using may not resonate with them. So give them an experience of what, this could look like, this could feel like, not just here, but also here and in the body. I, I was struck, and I don't have this statistic, but you talk in your book about how they've measured how, how, what percentage of our thoughts are sort of negative thoughts and how- yeah, 70%. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, astound, first of all, I don't know how you get there, but still I was astounded that 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 number is so high if there's anything that we can do to sort of l lower that number a and if at the same time i could be uh being a more mindful uh integrated person and work to to break some of the biases that are are i've learned and are there about other people and myself, I, I think that that is, is well worth the practice and at least Great. giving it a shot. Um, I also was really struck by this statistic um, 
that I thought would be all cr- would be critical for all lawyers who hire, supervise, or manage others or teach others. You said that systemically, economists estimate that racial bias alone costs the American economy at least two trillion dollars annually in terms of wasted costs and thwarted performance. Can you break that down for us and what might this number represent and why did you think it was important to sort of make the business case for breaking this bias? I think we're, you know, the latter question is basically it's, you know, straightforward because a lot of us, you know, we are working in a capitalist system, right? And for us, money is one of those scarce resources that we like to protect and save. Um, That's just, you know, practical. And for me, the inefficiency and the cost of bias overrides everything, right? And we really have to get around to really breaking bias. And racial bias is just one form of bias, right? There's gender bias, sexuality bias, age bias, you name it, right? Um, So it's just really expensive. And what is this? This is basically an aggregate of all the causes. Think about all the disparities that exist in our country from education to employment to criminal justice to healthcare and beyond. And what's happening at the micro level, at the one person level, because of implicit bias, someone was arrested and thrown into prison. Well, someone had to pay for that, right? That cop's time, that human being's time, which could have been gone to, you know, making money or doing something productive, as well as to when this person is in jail, someone's paying for their food, their clothing, registering them, all of those have costs. Similarly, in a healthcare situation, when a, a nurse or a doctor misdiagnoses a person, repeat admissions because of misdiagnoses, all of these, when we aggregate it to 330 million people, co- create a lot of costs. You know, suspending students in school, for example, due to implicit bias and explicit bias. So for me, like, and these are the numbers that we're seeing across the board. Um, and for me, that's kind of to really invite those of us that are really economically minded to be like, oh, we need to break these biases. Like, we need to train our nervous systems and kind of seeing these stereotypes and then replacing them and really not let these stereotypes be determine how we make decisions day to day. But, you know, beyond the costs of bias, you know, there's two other things. Bias is the root cause of every inequity and injustice in our society, whether it's conscious bias or unconscious bias. And the other reason we want to break bias, particularly those of us that are public interest minded, you know, like the two of us, um, is it causes unnecessary human suffering. Like I look at my life and like the amount of time and energy and resources I spend wishing I was someone else. Oh my God, like I wish sometimes I just had my life back, right? The hours and days and years. And that's true for all of us, you know? And that's why, you know, we could, this I feel like is what we need to do to really evolve human consciousness in this century. I had two follow-up questions to that. The first one is, in the section on the science of stereotyping, you, you state, Quote, growing up as a queer brown man in America, I accepted that bias and inequity were a part of life because I, like many people with subordinated identities, experienced these inequities firsthand. However, as I became a functioning adult, I found myself in education and professional settings where I interacted with humans who didn't experience these disparities, were misinformed about them, or didn't know about them at all. As a result, they denied their existence outright. Their assumption, the law guarantees equality and therefore there is equality, or the law prohibits discrimination and so there is no discrimination unless you prove otherwise. This this took my breath away. I was cheering like this, this, this is how I feel. Um, And I was just talking about this in class last week. I feel like when we are doing this work, this diversity work, equity work, belonging work, we are always being asked for statistics and data and testimonials. So, well, how do you know there is a problem? Well, have you surveyed everyone? If you survey people, it's, well, th- this isn't statistically significant. Or did you ask them the right questions? Who vetted these questions? There is this constant request, overwhelming request for data. 
And I think data is great. I'm a librarian, but <laughs> it starts shifting from, I believe that this exists. Let's, you know, ferret it out and work on it to prove this exists. Um, so in started, instead of starting from the place of believing that inequities and discrimination exist and working from there, we are starting from a different place. Can you talk a little bit about this? What should we as legal educators um, or administrators be doing about this? Yeah, no, I think it's really something that I struggled with so long until I came to that place of acceptance. So one of the reasons why people who haven't experienced them or misinformed about them deny the existence of these challenges is because it's painful. So it goes back to that bias is emotional. For someone to accept that Black bodies in our country are less valued, are more susceptible to police violence, you really feel the pain, right? That what happens to that human being, their families, their communities, you know, that requires us to have empathy. And this is why it's so important for us to then, you know, return to that place of building empathy. You know, the science has also shown that there is a massive empathy gap that exists in our society with respect to, um, you know, marginalized identities. You know, particularly folks who are houseless, that's like the most extreme. And this is where I think it's so important for um, law professors and practitioners to really begin to practice this themselves, right? And then the other two aspects of it is misinformation, right? There's so much misinformation. Like Nicole, you would be surprised how many doctors, teachers, lawyers I've talked to in the last 10 years who believe that race is biological. Like they believe that we're genetically different racial cat. Like it's not a social construct. It's not just a story that someone made up because that's what they were taught. <laughs> and they never questioned it. They believed it, right, in their textbooks. Or there's an information gap, right? So there's basically, they were never taught what race is or not but they learned it from the media or education or their friends and family. So I think that's where correcting misinformation is so important. Like we do need that data. Our minds, like I'm super curious, like I needed to understand because I believed in the false story of race. I did believe for a while that because I have brown skin and I come from a different part of the world, maybe I'm in, I am inferior because that's what I learned, right? Uncivilized, heathen, pagan, all the things. Um, until I was like, oh, no, this was just some bogus story some narcissist made up, <laughs> you know, someone who liked to collect skulls for a hobby. And like, oh, OK, OK, not going to believe that story. And that's what we need to train our young people around. So that's where I think. Um, but I think all of this starts with what you shared, actually, that it starts with accepting reality for what it is. That there is injustice, there is inequity. And I think for me, as a young activist, as a young advocate, shooting reality caused me so much suffering. It shouldn't be like this. But sweetheart, it is like this. <laughs> you know? Um, and that's and once I accept him, like, oh, now I have fuel to do something about it. I also read, and I hope that this statistic is wrong, I read somewhere that when they did sort of personality tests of, of lawyers, that we scored high on some areas of um, uh, of intelligence, but we as a whole scored low on, you know, sort of human intelligence and, and things like soft skills, like empathy. And so I think it's like even more interesting um, yeah. that, you know, we have this group of people who really value education, but maybe sort of deficit in some areas. And yeah. when, people say, hey, maybe we, we should educate you on these areas. It's like thought of as sort of lesser, non-doctrinal. I mean, there's no like mandatory yeah. first year class in empathy. And so we have to really think about the hierarchies of, of our profession and how yeah. this is intertwined with all of it. Um, And I will get back to what I was going to say, but now we're sort of on something else that I noticed. The book, which comes out next week and that Liz is dropping information in the chat, it contains really detailed history. Um, why did you include so much so much history 
uh, specifically about the race as a social construct, um, you acknowledge in one of the PRISM exercises that the history that you shared is, quote, hidden from us outside of select graduate courses and academic textbooks. Why do you think that is? And, and why did you really want to um, make sure to dive deeply into history? Yeah. I think for me, it was really about just setting this setting the record straight. Because, you know, for me as someone who is a brown person of Indian heritage, also an American, I am not part of the race conversation, right, generally. You know, it's black and white, and then others here and there. And, you know, as a queer person, I am not part of the gender conversation, right? So I was like, yo, where do I fit? Because I'm also human, right, in all of this. And that's where I went to the science and to the historical record to really piece this story together so we can see everyone, the full spectrum of humanity, regardless of where they're from, whether they're from Solomon Islands to you know Mozambique to Brazil or indigenous communities in Greenland and Denmark. And that's why I think it was really important for me to really kind of, and I did this for myself initially, right? I, I know I was really blessed to be um, a student of Derek Bell's um, in law school. He passed away the year I graduated law school after he taught the last class he taught with us. And that's what he basically, you know, inspired me to do, to really go to the root cause, to go to the origin and source of things and understand where and why these fabricated stories were built and how they've then been institutionalized. And for me, that's why the history piece is really important because it's actually quite recent history. As I shared earlier, like a lot of people believe that race as a construct has been around for thousands of years. Actually, no. <laughs> it's just as old as our country. It's a couple of hundred years. And in the deep, in the span of deep time, right, 10,000 years, that's like a blip. So for me, that actually reassures me that we can change these social constructs. We can transform the way we understand one another outside of racializing ourselves, putting ourselves in all of these boxes and break these boxes all together. And that's something, you know, I get inspired by Grace Lee Boggs, you know, the really wonderful Chinese American activist from Detroit, um, who really talked about that, you know, revolutions aren't really about, um, you know, changing state power. Because as, you know, we've changed parties or administrations, the new party that emerges becomes the oppressor. But a real revolution is really about combining two things. Recognize that we're responsible for the evolution of human consciousness. Um, and that's, you know, you know, recognizing and evolving is what this is really about. And I think for me, I really wanted to set this record straight in a simple way, in a non-academic way, in a personal way, so anyone can understand it without needing to like go to a dictionary and additional resources. Those are provided if they need additional resources, but you're like, oh, this is how we got here. You know, like for me to kind of go into some of the primary texts around how this Indian subcontinent, for example, was colonized by the British. It was all because of the story of race. You know, there's a place that I found that, you know, Winston Churchill basically said that he hates Indians. He hates heathens. He hates everything about them, which is why he was, he single-handedly was responsible for the Victorian Holocaust, where three to four million Bengalis died of starvation. But we never learn about these histories. This was in the 1940s. Um, so this is why it's really important for us to set the record straight that all of us around the world are part of the story. You know, it's not just about one group or the other. So we can see one another and then build empathy to them change that story and build a new world you know i so i think it it bears saying that the book is not necessarily written for lawyers the book is written for everybody and although lawyers can certainly read it <laughs> <laughs> please um, and then I, also it's to sort of to answer people in the chat there's sort of the the science of it there's your journey, but then there's also these exercises built in throughout the book. So it's not just here's the history. It's here's the history. This is how I've sort of come to 
find the history. This is the work I did. And here's a section for us to stop and do an exercise about this. And these are exercises that can be done alone and should be done alone, but also exercises that can be done with a group. And that way, I think it makes it a really great book to read with a book club or read with a a, a, a group of administrators or read with a faculty uh, because you can uh, do these exercises and, and some of them are about how you feel, but some of them are also, uh, I was struck by something you said in the, the last answer, the marginalized identities um, are, it exist, you know, throughout modern history in all over the world. And you bring up some examples of people who are marginalized because of their race, but also because of their religion, because of their gender. And they're not necessarily the the ones that maybe an average American would know, or maybe you've heard about it in the news, but you haven't done a deep dive. And you sort of invite people to do that. And so yeah. I liked how the book was not just, hey, here's all this information, but let me help you process it. It's part of the prism. Yeah. Let, let's help you process it and let's help you learn more and support yeah. your own sort of curiosity. Um, did I do it justice there? Did you want to add anything to that? No, I think it's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. And it's it's also so beautiful to have a reader reflect that back to me because it just feels like such a gift. One thing I would add is that some of the things we talked about, the legal classroom, you know, um, how do we shift some of these ways of being? And these are institutional biases that are embedded in the way the law is taught. And I think the opportunity here, once again, is as professors like yourself and the dean here, you're really leading by example. You're part of that consciousness. That this is the, for me, as I think about Malcolm Gladwell's, Gladwell's work, we're the early adopters, right? But we're now moving towards building a critical mass, you know, with ADI and others. So there's going to be a point where there'll be a tipping point where this will become normalized. And that's the way social change movements take place. And I think we're part of our own social change movement, really transforming the law. And, you know, for most for most of us believe that law is the instrument for social change. Um, but we're, And we're part of that movement building right now. I uh, wanted to highlight a question in the chat. So mm -hmm. as you say that, I think about the tremendous privilege I have being at a private institution with a supportive administration in a very blue state, one of the bluest. Um, <laughs> but that's not the experience of all legal professionals and law professors and humans. Do you have no. any recommendations for minimizing the way students feel or experience bias in the classroom, specifically in states or places at institutions uh, where it is difficult or impossible or uh, it, it, illegal or against policy to have these discussions in an explicit way? Are there sort of other ways that we can interact, present, or work with students to help them within the confines of what is allowable. Absolutely. I think this is why I think skillful means is so important, you know, and this is where the PRISM toolkit comes in handy. What I would say is that because we can't speak in a certain way, what we can do is offer people an experience, right, through tools like, you know, pro-social behaviors, perspective taking, stereotype replacement, and really connected not to particular identities, but to a common humanity, right? And reminding people, like in the book, um, I talk about that all of us as human beings have two identities, and that's it. A primary identity and a secondary identity. All the labels we attach to this body, you know, queer, brown, man, lawyer, teacher, whatever, these are secondary identities. And our primary identity is really being human, being part of this human species. So I think there's ways for us to... Um, have students and faculty and others kind of relate to that connection. Uh, and once again, it's really about helping people move from their heads into our hearts, right? And that's going to then fuel their curiosity. It's going to fuel wanting to learn more. Um, yeah. Let's see again. Thanks. Um, this is my last question, um, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this because it was really on my mind when I was re reading the book. Um, you talk about internalized bias as a form 
of conscious and unconscious bias where harmful mental formations influence our thoughts, words, and actions towards ourselves. Um, some of those on the call today work in access schools and all of us work with first gen students. Um, some of these students or many of these students seem to have these internalized biases. Um, and it is hard to support them because they, they need to do the work of breaking them. Um, but do you have any suggestions for how we help our, our students who have these internalized biases sort of work to, to overcome them? Yeah, I think part of the goal is not to fix anyone, right? So allow everyone to have their journey. Um, but the way I've done it, this is my way, this is not the right, this is not the way, it's a way, um, is acknowledge it. Internalized biases exist. And just like any form of bias, they have five causes, right? You know, story, policies, social contact, education, and media. That's basically the crux of the book. And you can undo them using these five tools, the PRISM tools, um, and other ways. And I think it's really important to define, because a lot of people don't even recognize, like, I didn't know that internalized bias existed. I was like, I can't be racist. I can't be sexist. I can't be homophobic. I was like, whoa, like I have all these thoughts about myself, you know, <laughs> like, um, you know, so that's where I think it's important to provide students with that language. And, but then also talk about its impacts, right? There's so much research and studies on this, you know, it's, it's impact on our performance, our productivity, our sense of well being. So, and then as we hear these statistics, these studies, we're like, oh, I can relate to that. Like, yeah, I do like limit my own potential. Oh, I do undercompensate or overcompensate for who I am. Oh, I do tire myself out. And that's where I think the curiosity comes. So that's one thing. And then really give them the experience of what it would be like to heal from that. You know, perspective taking is really great as an exercise um, for that too. The, the work of being a law student is hard enough. The work of being a <laughs> human being and an adult is hard enough. I think I, I thought about how helpful some of what you were saying and, you know, sort of helping students or at least leading them to shed some of these internal biases would help in an academic success content. Um, because how much of the problems are internal? Um, and I mean, I don't know that we'll ever know, but I think it would be helpful to consider that. Um, yeah. uh, before I let you go, can you, uh, you're about to have a whirlwind next few weeks. Can you tell us uh, what is to come in the next few weeks and months for you and your book? What should we be looking for? Yeah, well, I think it's exciting. I'll just be talking more and more about the book. We're in a very heated election cycle. There are a lot of events happening around the world that have to do with bias. So what I'm doing my best in really helping people understand the nature of bias and how we can address it. Um, for folks that are interested in learning more, you know, go to my website, anugaptany.com. We're doing a bunch of events. Um, so you can find all those events there. Please come join me. I'll be in person in several places around the country, um, as well as connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and other places. Because, you know, for me, this is our work for the century. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. Uh, and also to kind of shift the conversation from shame, blame, and guilt to really one of like empathy and unity and solutions. Thanks. I'm sorry that I am leaving questions in the chat because I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I just want to th say thank you. Um, thank mm. you to Anu. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you for everyone who attended today. Our next session is on October 23rd at 2 p.m. Um, uh, Professor Natasha Variani is talking about her new book, Owning Our Values. Um, again, thank you so much, Anu. This was amazing. And I'm sure you will get future emails from me begging you to come back. Oh, thank you. I can't. Everybody. Yes, I can't wait. Thank you, everyone, for joining and look forward to staying in touch.